People in Japan pay a surcharge on their electricity bills to support the development of renewable energy. Yet the move to renewables is not going as smoothly as planned. The accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant three years ago prompted Japan's government to begin promoting renewable energy. It was a major policy shift. Solar energy was considered the most promising option. But only 20% of the solar projects authorized by the state are now producing power. Frankly, it's not commercially viable. Flaws in government planning are partly to blame. Initially, all applicants had to do to start a solar business was fill in the necessary paperwork. Some people applied for permission to operate on farmland where solar panels can't be installed. Others failed to get approval from landowners. I've never heard of the plan. Never! The problem must be dealt with immediately. The rules have to be changed. Meanwhile, many companies are unable to increase output because of problems in the power grid. The government says it will speed up efforts to promote renewable energy, but what caused these problems in the first place? We'll take a closer look. Welcome to today's close-up. I'm Hiroko Kunia. The Japanese government released its draft energy plan last week. The plan said the country would move more quickly to develop renewable energy sources such as wind, solar and geothermal power. It's been almost three years since the Fukushima disaster. The government plan calls for defining nuclear power as a baseload energy source. That means it can produce a steady supply of electricity throughout the day. The plan also highlights a policy to promote renewables. It will require massive investment to build generation facilities and strengthen supply grids. How can Japan design an affordable system that takes full advantage of renewable energy? The government is undertaking extensive reforms with that goal in mind. Industry officials aim to have a new system in place in two years. The new system would allow consumers to compare prices and purchase electricity from the utility of their choice, including those generating power using renewable sources. It's still not clear just what this system will look like, but it is clear that the current approach based on a feed-in tariff is not adequate. The government introduced the tariff in July 2012. Under the current system, renewable energy producers apply for government approval for their projects. Once that's accomplished, they can sell all of their output to electric utilities at fixed prices for a certain period of time. The utilities can pass the costs on to their customers. But the system isn't working. Only 20 percent of the solar power projects that have received the government's go-ahead have begun producing energy. This has prompted the government to decide to revoke approval for more than 600 projects. Now, Let's look at how this happened. This company in Tokyo generates solar power. Last year, company officials received a proposal. This document shows the government has given the green light to a solar project in Kyushu. It says the maximum daily output will be 49,000 kilowatts. We accompanied staff from the company that developed the project to the proposed site.
Company officials say they plan to set up more than 200,000 solar panels in an area of over 1 million square meters. But most of the site is on a slope that faces north. It also includes farmland whose use for other purposes is restricted. Why did the government approve the plan? Initially, projects got a thumbs up even if the planners had not obtained consent from the people who owned the land. The applications merely had to include the names of the project's operators and a description of the facilities. This is the first I've heard about the project. I want to know why they chose this place. The Tokyo-based company concluded the project was not viable and turned it down. Company officials have received about 500 proposals, but they say most lack the potential to become good businesses. Only one proposal in 100 makes sense. Most of the rest are trash. Shortly after the government introduced the feed-in tariff system, would-be producers flocked to the solar power business. They were drawn by the generous purchase price the government had set. The system requires utilities to buy electricity from solar power generators. The initial price for solar power was more than 40 cents per kilowatt hour. That's almost twice the price for wind or geothermal. The price will stay the same for 20 years. Solar power generators stand to make huge profits, even after their initial investments. Many say applying for government approval was easy. They say they expected to make a lot of money. No one in the industry ministry or the utilities checks our applications and the government guarantees the price for the next 20 years. That's why the solar power business is heated up so quickly. Another factor is also to blame for the slower than expected progress of solar energy in Japan. Many solar projects have been drawn up for Hokkaido, where large plots of land are relatively cheap. Our site stretches to that white fence over there. A company bought this former racehorse ranch for about one million dollars. It wanted to start producing power as quickly as possible. But a letter from Hokkaido Electric Power Company arrived just as work to install solar panels was about to begin. The utility said it couldn't buy electricity from the firm. The letter has dealt a severe blow to our project. The project has promise. I have doubts about the outlook for Japan's solar power business. How could something like this happen? Japanese law says utilities cannot refuse to buy renewable energy. 
拒んではならないと決められています。But it also says they can limit the amount they buy if it could hamper their efforts to ensure a stable energy supply. Hokkaido Electric expects nuclear regulators to allow it to restart its reactors. It sees nuclear energy as its basic power source. Thermal power comes next. The company has limited the amount of solar power it will purchase to 400,000 kilowatts of its total energy mix. Officials say the power supply would otherwise become too unstable. The would be power generator says such actions could inhibit the adoption of solar energy. Our firm hit a plateau only a few years after clean energy began gaining attention. We are extremely disappointed. The business of solar power generation will stop making sense. Joining us in the studio is University of Tokyo professor Toshihiro Matsumura. He's a member of the industry ministry panel studying the feed-in tariff scheme. Professor, the government has tried to promote solar energy by requiring utilities to purchase it at a fixed price. But more than 600 companies are going to be stripped of their certification. What went wrong? No one expected so many companies to apply with such sloppy plans. In that respect, the design of the system itself was probably at fault. Part of the reason this happened is that many firms rushed to secure a slot because they expected the price, which was certainly high, to start falling rapidly. So they tried to obtain certification for its own sake, even though they weren't able to generate power? We can't deny that possibility, but if the conditions had been too strict, it would have discouraged new businesses from entering the industry. Our group is reviewing ways to prevent problems of this sort. For example, the basic screening framework might remain unchanged, with only the worst cases being rejected. But we could perhaps revoke the licenses of firms that don't start generating power within a certain time after they are certified, or maybe reduce the amount of money they've received. How might application requirements be changed? One change might involve rejecting applications from companies that haven't secured a suitable plot of land. And how long would you wait before revoking licenses? Probably about six months. We also saw cases where some companies had the right kind of property. They were just about to start generating power when the local electric utility told them their electricity couldn't be transmitted. In other words, business is being held up at the discretion of the major utilities. Doesn't this run counter to the government's policy of promoting renewable energy? It does, but we have to limit the number of unpredictable energy sources to ensure a stable energy supply. Unpredictable? Solar power, wind power. Oh, you mean the volume of power generated will fluctuate? Yes, but there's also the issue of whether the 400,000 kilowatt limit is reasonable. I think it's open to discussion. If a renewable energy firm is suddenly told one day, without a clear reason, that its power can no longer be transmitted, people will think twice about starting new businesses. We will probably need to establish a third-party monitoring system to confirm such limits are transparent and feasible. If such firms were suddenly denied access to power grids, it would certainly discourage investment. 
Of course, it would have a big impact on business. So, it will be very important to have a neutral third party publish objective standards beforehand. Power generators are struggling with the challenge of having their power delivered. This appears to be hampering government efforts to promote renewable energy. Let's take a look at the slow progress being made in building appropriate infrastructure. A renewable energy trade show was held in Tokyo last week. More than 1,500 firms from Japan and abroad were there to promote their technologies. Many are focusing on wind power, whose potential output is higher than that of solar. General Electric is a U.S. firm. The company has developed a turbine that can generate electricity efficiently even in countries like Japan that are prone to typhoons. But we see an opportunity. We are completely confident that 285103 is the right turbine for the Japanese market. But many participants said the lack of extensive power grids is a key bottleneck for renewable energy. How can we connect turbines to power grids? Japan's system must change. Both Japan and Germany have remote northern areas where strong winds are common, but not much electricity is consumed there. Power grids must be upgraded to transmit electricity from these places. What's the main challenge for Japan's power grids? They've been built by major utilities to transmit electricity from nuclear and thermal power plants to consumers. Companies entering the wind power market can't deliver their energy unless they build such systems themselves. Rokkasho village in Aomori prefecture is one of Japan's main wind power hubs. Easterly winds blow in the summer and westerly winds blow in winter. It's an ideal site for wind power. This company has already built more than 50 turbines, but it lacks adequate access to power grids. The firm used to transmit power to a nearby transformer substation on lines it built on its own. But when it tried to expand capacity, the local utility said the substation had reached its limit and could not accept any more power. This is the area near Rokkasho. Tohoku Electric has a transformer substation here. We could supposedly resolve the situation by setting up new power lines that lead to the station. But the distance to the substation is 40 kilometers. It would cost more than 40 million dollars to install new lines. The power generator would have to assume the cost. The company would also have to maintain the lines. The high costs make the company hesitant to expand. Rokkasho has the ideal conditions for generating wind power, but it can't increase capacity. It's unfortunate. Japan is not taking full advantage of its natural resources. That's the reality, and it's a waste. Large-scale use of renewables also requires a massive revamping of transmission lines to major cities that consume the most electricity. Northern Hokkaido is believed to have the potential to produce roughly half of Japan's wind power. 
The government estimates the region could churn out nearly 4 million kilowatts. Telecommunications carrier SoftBank is considering a major project in the region. We will forge ahead with renewables at top speed. The company plans to install more than 150 wind turbines in Hokkaido through its subsidiary SB Energy. These eight districts are the target locations. The company estimates that wind power generated in northern Hokkaido could meet about 10% of the Tokyo area's vast energy needs. One weak link is the transmission line that crosses the strait between Hokkaido and the main island of Honshu. The line is operating at capacity. It could cost as much as $5 billion to upgrade. The whole project will be meaningless if we can't send power across the strait. We need a breakthrough. No single company can beef up the cross-strait line on its own. We must team up with other companies, the government and other organizations, to move things forward. SB Energy is hoping the government will take the lead in drawing up a blueprint for a better nationwide grid. What's at stake is the future of the country's energy supply over the long term, so the direction of national policy must be more thoroughly debated. We need to review the power generation network and patterns of consumption. So, the key to introducing more renewable energy sources really lies in the power grid and whether we can invest more money in its development. Yes, Japan's inter-regional power grids are extremely underdeveloped, not to mention the line connecting Hokkaido and Honshu. I must say, investment has been woefully inadequate. On the other hand, we need to stop and think whether it really makes sense to build wind turbines so far away and bring power over long distances to the places where it's needed the most. Producing power closer to home might cost more, but it could be cheaper in terms of transmission. We need to compare the costs of local production and long-distance distribution, and strike a good balance between the two options. In that sense, the country needs a new organization that can monitor grid conditions across Japan and consider the most efficient approaches to developing capacity. The organization should draw up an investment plan and think of the most practical ways to introduce renewable energy while making sure costs are kept to a minimum. That organization is due to be launched in 2015, as shown on this chart. It's one of the steps being planned for a major reform of Japan's electricity market. You said the new body will have nationwide oversight. Will that be possible? Well, it's supposed to draw up a national plan. Under the current system, each regional utility does its own planning to suit the region it serves. The new entity must be capable of creating development plans that are workable and can win broad public support and make sure the cost burden is fair and transparent. Finally, what do you think is the most crucial point in promoting the use of renewable energy in Japan? 
and helping it take root as quickly as possible. The feed-in tariff system is the most important element, and it should remain in place for a while. But relying on surcharges alone would result in a prohibitively high burden on the public. So at some point, renewable energy producers must be encouraged to stand on their own feet. And for this to happen, the electricity market has to be liberalized so that consumers can freely choose which producers to buy power from. If many of them choose renewables, the suppliers will receive a major push. Public backing is necessary for renewable energy to spread. Some consumers may opt for cheaper power, but others might choose renewables even if they cost more. Once this happens, the sector will receive more investment. Yes, and if suppliers can reduce costs, the market share will rise. Thank you very much, Professor Matsumura.